Hello, my name is Justin Perkins, and welcome to another edition of WaveLab Workflows. Hello, Matthias. Um, let me know if there's any audio or technical uh, visual issues. As you can probably hear, I'm still in my temporary setup. Um, my studio is getting a new floor, so I'm in a little office setup one, for one last time. Next time, we'll be back in the real studio. So please let me know if there's any issues, and I apologize if the sound is a little more echoey or a few more background sounds than usual today. Um, today's topic is just going to be a general overview of why I use WaveLab Pro for mastering. Um, I'm not really going to be showing how to do things, just so much th showing things about you know what you can do and why I like to use it. So I'll be breezing through a lot of features and things because I get this question a lot or I see this question a lot of people wondering, well, why do I need a uh, WaveLab when I have Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase. And to be honest, those programs can do a lot of audio processing, but they're not really set up for mastering specifically. And I'm also not talking about plugins, even though WaveLab does come with some nice plugins like Master Rig and a bunch of other stuff I'll show you. Um, the reason I use WaveLab is more for the functionality of, of how it, you bring audio into it and lay it out, sequence it like an album. Even though CDs are supposedly dead, uh, we still need to assemble projects for streaming, and I still do a lot of CDs and vinyl mastering. So there's a whole lot of reasons why we still need something like WaveLab, and I'm going to show you why I use it. Uh, so we're breezing just through a bunch of things. Um, if you have any questions, you can always visit, visit us on Facebook, at the WaveLab Users Group over on Facebook. There's also a WaveLab Forum on the Steinberg website. You can also rewatch this video and download a bunch of my presets that you're probably going to see here um, over at wavelabhelp.com because I have a number of presets already set up for things like metadata and rendering and all this stuff. So if you want kind of a better starting point, if you're new to WaveLab or if you just see something you like that I did, you can go to wavelabhelp.com and you can grab just some or all of my uh, preset files. And these aren't presets for like, you know, plugins to make things sound good. These are presets for operational type things such as rendering and all that good stuff. So um, let's get into it. I did mention that, you know, I, I do feel there's this differentiation between mixing and mastering and while well, you can do the stereo processing in any DAW, um, WaveLab has a lot of cool special things. Um, one big difference um, between WaveLab and maybe another program is it has it has a few different modes. It has the audio editor, which is just a direct two-track stereo editor. And WaveLab does do some multi-channel and surround things. I don't personally work in that avenue, so I'm not comfortable even pretending I know um, much about that. But the concept is the same. It has a standalone editor. I call it the stereo editor. It could be a multi-channel editor, but basically this is more of a destructive environment with some features to help you do some intelligent undoing if you want to, uh, I believe it's nonlinear undo now, but basically I use this um, section for checking incoming files before I master them and checking files after I master them before I send them out to check for issues. Um, things like that. So the audio editor is not a place I spend a lot of time in, but it does have a few different views like spectrogram and, and loudness, which is kind of interesting. It's going to take a while to analyze that, but just be aware of the two different modes. We have the audio editor, and then I'm actually going to um, assemble an audio montage for you um, pretty quickly here um, because that's where I spend a lot of my time working. WaveLab also has a batch processor and some DVD authoring and other stuff I don't use much, but I'd say I spend 99% of my time in the audio editor, or sorry, the audio montage. And again, the audio editor is great for analyzing incoming files, analyzing outgoing files. I don't do a lot of edits there because uh, maybe I'll explain why as we move along. But this is the audio montage, which may not look like much at first, or, or may not look very different, but you can of course see that it says audio montage there. Um, and I like to call the audio montage a non-destructive environment uh, because it's a little bit more like a typical DAW session. There's a session file um, 
and it's not really destructive. You can undo things, and everything's kind of running live. Um, I've heard, I've seen about a number of people talk about how they do the mastering, you know, the stereo processing, and then they 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 kind of stress out about assembling the DDP and assembling the album as this whole extra complicated step, and it doesn't really need to be that way. Um, you, it, with WaveLab, you kind of do it all at once. You assemble it, get the track markers in, get the song spacing correct, any fades, of course, make it sound good. And then from there, you can render any and all formats. You can render your high res, high resolution digital master. You can render a DDP. You can render MP3s. You can render uh, a WAV file of each side for vinyl or cassette. Um, so my point is, you know, you basically just assemble everything one time. And that way everything is cohesive. You know, a, a mistake that you could make when you try to use like a Pro Tools or Cubase or anything like that for mastering is um, when you do go to assemble, like say the physical master, like a CD master or vinyl, you know, you run the risk of accidentally adjusting the song spaces or ha at least having it be different. So you want to make sure that your streaming master and Vinyl Master and CD Master all have the same exact song spacing that your client has approved and has been listening to. You don't want any surprises, especially on 500 or 1,000 records or CDs. So, um, again, another reason for just doing it all in one, one spot that's meant for this. So I'm going to load some files in. You can do this really quickly um, as far as loading in the files, entering the data, and being able to render. I'm going to be going a little bit slowly because I'm going to be explaining things, but... You know, if aside from the audio decisions, I'm talking like maybe one minute by the time I've got everything loaded in, sequenced, named, and ready for rendering with all the correct names, with all the metadata, all the CD text. It's extremely fast and easy. Um, obviously, I'm not going to be getting into any audio decisions right now and, and making things sound good. That that's not the intent of this video. But let's let's load in these. Um, six files, and I should stress that WaveLab doesn't really um, hold your hand like other programs might. I've already set up this path. I've set up a band name, which is the WaveLabs. I've made up an album title called Greatest Hits. Um, I've got a file, a folder of original files. Now, if I was mastering this all in the box, I'd be grabbing these files. I'm going to show you from I've done some analog processing on, on these six songs. So these are already sounding closer to being done. And I'm just going to use these for the sake of um, expediting this video. But my point was, I've already made these file paths. You know, I'm not loading these in from my downloads folder or my Dropbox folder or my desktop. You have to put files where you want them to live so you know that they are going to be there and organize. You know, that way when I move this folder to an archive hard drive, if I move this whole folder, everything's going with it with the same hierarchy of, of folders and files. So um, my point is I'm going to load these in and it's not making a copy of the files. It's just loading them in directly. I've already made um, the correct, this, this montage 96K sample rate. You can, of course, make any sample rate. Um, and I've made my montage from a template, which I've talked about in other videos. So everything's kind of set how I want. Um, of course, you can use the up and down arrows to select and move the song, the files in whatever the song order is. Or I have already done some processing on these. So these have metadata in them, track number metadata. metadata. So you can see that I'm going to be pressing this button here. And it's going to sort them based on the track number metadata that WaveLab detected in the files. Now, if your files don't have that, that's not a big deal. You can... Like I said, use up and down arrow to select a song, and you can hold command and arrow to move. You know, this. My whole point is, you can really quickly s determine the song order with this menu system before it even inserts the files. I'm going to revert back to the embedded metadata. Um, I like to use one track with lanes to to arrange the songs, and you can stagger the files on two lanes. The thing I don't do, but you can do, you can have every song be on the same track. Um, and then you, of course, um, sequence them, and we'll get into that. Um, I don't like this because I like to be ready for any songs that need to overlap and crossfade. And you can, of course, overlap and crossfade on one track, but you have less control over things. So I'll show you what I like to do for, for EPs and albums. Like I said, whether songs are going to overlap or not, I just like this... Um, 
approach. And the other reason I really like Wave Lab is I see a lot of people um, trying to master in Pro Tools or Logic or Cubase, and their screen kind of looks like this. And I just that just drives me nuts because it's such a waste of screen space, you know, to have this stair step thing going on. You got such small waveforms. If you're using track effects, you're potentially bogging down your computer to process a bunch of silence, even though th there is dynamic processing. I, I'm not convinced that it always works. So I don't like the stair step thing. Uh, my my preference, and there's so many different ways to do the same thing in WaveLab, but my preference is to use a single track using lanes, and I stagger them in alternating lanes. Of course, I've got the song order correct. So this is how I like to look at it. For me, this is the waveforms are big enough to see what I need to see. If songs need to crossfade, I can do that without making a mess, and then I can choose my own crossfading uh, when we get to that point. Um, so the songs are loaded in. I'm going to save. WaveLab is very smart. Um, when I go to save, the path where the files came from is already chosen. So again, there's a million ways to do it how you like to do it. I like to do this. I like to call it the band name, the release title. I, I have a little um, keyboard shortcut here. And I'm, when I... Uh, When I think about it too hard, I, I, that's when I forget what it actually is. So I just screwed that up. But uh, let's try that one more time. But my whole point is I like to name montages a certain way. And I'm just going to have to... I'm totally blanking on my... It's all muscle memory. So... There it is. Um, I like to name my montages like that. Sorry, like I said, I, if you ask me to tell you what the shortcut is, I can't tell you, but it's just all really fast muscle memory. I like to name my montages like that because I'm going to be working in 64-bit float because that's what WaveLab processes at. It's a 96K montage. It's the Digital Master. It's version 1. The little underscore indicates that it's the main source montage with all my plugins. So now we've got a montage, and... Uh, WaveLab creates a little montage file. It's green. Um, and that is th the, basically the DAW file that tells the program where everything goes and what plugins you got and what levels and what settings. Um, so, again, it's not going to copy the files for you. There's, um, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but it's best to just manage the files yourself. Um, so... Once the files are in, it's very easy to sequence them. You know, obviously I would listen and determine how much space goes there. If there needs to be a fade, you can easily trim and drag things around to get the right spacing between the songs. Um, and again, this is all non-destructive. I'm actually going to jump ahead. Um, one of my favorite features of WaveLab in recent years is the reference track feature. And, you know, maybe this doesn't happen for every project, but I get... Um, a fair amount of times the band or artist already knows which, um, you know, how much spacing they want between the songs or even a potential crossfade. So, um, there's two things that reference tracks are good for. Um, as you can see, there's a little R for reference track. Um, reference track means I'm not going to hear this unless I solo it. So it's great for comparing sounds what you're doing up here versus maybe an, an already mastered song or a reference master, um, all sorts of things. Um, could be, could be that. Um, but it's also good for sequencing. And I thought I, um, I thought I did a good thing here, but I apparently screwed that up. But the other thing that reference tracks are good for is, um, overlapping when songs overlap clients can send you a file with how they want it already and then you can visually match it up to that um, and again i just made a mistake when i prepared this file but let's pretend i didn't um, you know you could use the reference file to kind of match up the waveforms and these aren't going to match up because it's something happened when i made this file but in a perfect world this file would have all the same songs in that order and um I could be matching it up. 
let's see what's going on here. Okay, I just I made a mistake somewhere. But the whole point is that you can kind of use their file as a guide to match up the sequencing, you know, to say these songs are going to crossfade um, and, and all that good stuff. And these songs, you know, so I like to use... And then you can you can have the reference track routed to another hardware output on your monitor controller, or you can just solo it. And the nice thing is it's not going through any plugins that you're, we're going to insert later. You're always hearing just this um, audio, so you can do a nice comparison. You're not hearing their reference version going through some mastering audio processing chain that you have going on. It's a very good way to A-B. And again, you can solo it here or send it to uh, other, other uh, hardware paths. Um, so my idea for the reference track got a little bit goofed up, but you get the idea. Comparing audio, comparing visuals. So I guess I'm going to delete this for now since it's not going to match up. But my point is, um, you know, you can, if we want to do a little crossfade here, we can. So once the songs are arranged, um, now it's time to make track markers. Uh, well, I mean... I don't want to give a whole mastering demo, but for those that don't know WaveLab, we have clip effects, track effects, and montage output effects. And my version of WaveLab may look a little different than yours, because um, I don't care for using the master section, because that's not really tied to one particular montage. You have to save and load it separately. Um, I do all my work in the inspector within the montage. So your version of WaveLab could look like this. I prefer this layout. Um, doesn't matter really, but we have clip effects, which is putting plugins right on each file. So if I were to put an EQ here, it's only affecting that one song. And if I skip to this song, you can see there is no um, plug in there. So I've, I've done a whole video just on effects. So if you want to go to wavelabhelp.com and, and watch the uh, that video, I don't want to get too into the weeds here, but Track effects are something I don't really use because that's going to affect all these songs equally, but only on this track. And then montage out is typically where I have a final limiter or or dithering after that. Um, my whole point is once you got your audio decisions made, I'm going to leave plugins out of the equation so we have faster rendering. But let's say I love this sequence. Um, I have a lot of stream deck commands to speed up the process. Again, I could do all this in about one minute if I wasn't trying to explain it, even trying to explain it quickly, but the CD wizard, um, and if you're seeing these windows pop up in the corner, it's because I'm on a different size screen and because uh, I'm in a different setup. Um, but I like to use the CD wizard to generate markers for each song. And again, I have a preset that's already loaded with my montage template, so this is very fast. Um, if we had the ISRC codes, which we do, we could add them. I could add the first code right now. It's going to populate them all up by one digit, which is often how albums go. But again, these are my preferred settings if you want to pause it and look at it. And as you can see, it's created markers for each song. Now, if these file names are perfectly named already because I named them in my analog session. If your file names are a mess because it says, because the mix engineer named them messy and it has four, you know, the sample rate in it and the mix number and some initials and a bunch of gibberish, um, you would rename them in the markers tab. And I have a... Pr this is just a note. I have a project intake form that my clients fill out. You know, it could be, or you could get a text, a word document or whatever. But this is where you just quickly copy and paste the, the song titles in, not on the clips tab, but in the markers tab. The clips tab, I like to keep original so I know which file it is, if it's version one, version two. Uh, but renaming the markers is a good idea at this stage because it's going to help it's going to help populate all the CD text and metadata and file names. It's going to make your life easier. So if, if you do need to change anything, this is the spot in the markers tab. Um, now, in the case of crossfades, you probably do need to look at at uh, where that marker was dropped and adjust it. And you can very quickly toggle through and just check all your markers. Um, as you can see, my, my captures from analog have 200 milliseconds of dead space of digital silence built in so when the mark when the marker is put at the start of the file it's not at the first downbeat if, you, if you're mastering in the box and trimming everything tightly to the downbeat you can um, go to move multiple markers and again i have a preset 
um, that just offsets the markers from the start of each clip so that it's not so close to the downbeat. Um, I'm going to undo that, but it just kind of depends how you're working. If it's, if you're, I just, this is a year's habit of just having a little bit of digital silence baked into the files before the first sounds. That's why I don't care about this being trimmed tight because it's, it already is. But again, if you're doing stuff in the box or for whatever reason, if you need to offset the markers from the start of the clip, easily done. Um, so next thing would be to add the CD text. And you're probably wondering why I need, why would you need to add CD text? Um, CD text, the way I like to work, CD text determines the file names. And I purposely picked a song that has an uh, accent over the A because this accent over the A, we can still have it show up in the metadata, but we don't want that to be in our file names because that can cause problems, especially more extreme special characters or bad idea to put in file names or question marks at the end. But we can, st and it's not a valid CD text format, but we can put it in the metadata and have everything look good. So the next thing I do is um, the CD text editor. And I, again, I have a Stream Deck thing that does this all in one command for me. But the first thing I like to do is copy the the montage name, just because that's going to give me some good, correct data to paste in. So then I would just paste in the album title and delete what isn't the album title, paste in the band name. And you can, with one button, I can push the band name to every song. And with starting on track one, I can push the song name, the marker name to every song title. And you can see that accent that A turned into a question mark. And we're going to jump back to that uh, right now. For CD text purposes, I'm going to simplify that. That's just the way uh, life is. With CD text, you get Western European or Japanese. Um, you can choose to not restrict it to that, but don't recommend it. So we're going to dumb down the song title just for CD text. I'm also going to update my file name because I goofed it up when I was talking. There we go. So as you can see um, in the CD text editor, we got simplified still full on in the, in the marker name. Cause that's the metadata is going to be populated from the marker name, the file name. And of course the CD text is populated from the CD text. Um, so this is all done very quickly. I also wanted to point out, um, ripple mode if you go to edit this is a cool thing that you mostly see in mastering programs is if the client says they want to adjust the song spacing um, to do that in pro tools or cubase or grams have what these days but my point is when you move a song all the other songs after it move the relationship stays the same so that's a nice thing you can of course turn that off and just slide it around this is kind of what would happen in a normal recording program and then you have to select them all and hopefully you don't screw something up but ripple mode is nice that can be active globally per track or turned off um, you can replace files i didn't set up a i didn't set up a case for this but let's say your client sends you an updated mix of a song or if you need to ins uh, say the master's approved and you need to insert the instrumentals you, know, you can very quickly just, um, I have a key command, command R for replace, but you can also go to, uh, where is it? Edit. I don't even know where it is because I used the shortcut. Insert, replace audio file. You can navigate to it um, and, and replace it with an updated mix. And the nice thing there is you don't have to reapply any plugins or edits or fades. You know, you just pop in the new file and, uh, and it's good to go. Let's I can let's see if I can duplicate it. We'll pretend copy is mixed too. You know, I could just highlight that, and now we got the updated mix inserted in the sequence with very, very little hassle. With with great ease, we have a new version of the song in there, and of course, all the clip effects would stay. Everything's the same. It's very simple, much more simple than uh, I would find it to be in other programs. So. Um, I talked about clip effects, um, montage, the difference. I will say that clip effects are automatable. Um, I did a whole video on clip effect automation, but of course, if any plugins you have inserted right on each clip, you can automate the parameters, which is relatively new to WaveLab. I know it's not new to most recording programs, but new to WaveLab in case you've looked and, and didn't think it was possible. Um, 
I have talked about markers. You know, of course, the CD wizard does a good job of placing the markers, but you can freely move them. You can freely type in a new spot for the marker. Something I use a lot is when the client says, can you add two seconds between, or can you add one more second between these two songs? Sometimes I'll highlight that and I'll just change the 29 to a 30. And now I got, I know, and now I know it's exactly one more second was just added. I'll undo and redo it. That's a really precise way to do it other than like just dragging it and, and uh, all that guessing. So I like that you can manually edit the placement of the clips and the placement of the markers. Uh, let's talk about some metering and analysis. So that's a huge part of why I use WaveLab as well is the built-in metering. Um, you know, there's all sorts of plugins people use now. I even have a hardware Clarity M, which is nice. Um, I have a, lot, a number of things, but the built-in metering is hard to beat of WaveLab. Um, you know, we have the loudness meter that shows LUFS, all very customizable as far as colors and ranges. Uh, level meter is going to be your peaks and RMS. And I also like this panning. You know, it shows you the panning balance if it's if it's drifting left or right. Uh, pretty cool. And again, this is all customizable with colors and, and ranges. Time code. Uh, this is a huge one. I, when I see people trying to master in a Pro Tools session, so many times my clients will say, at, at three minutes, oh, these are short songs, so at two minutes... At one minute, um, in song three, there's a weird sound. Can you check it out? Well, in Pro Tools, if you didn't have... Uh, I'll just keep ripping on Pro Tools. In Pro Tools, you know, you have one counter, you have one timeline, that's it. So kind of like this top one here, you, you know, you have to find the start of the song and then measure a minute and kind of guess. With WaveLab, you have an exact, you know, the time code for each CD track or clip start which for me is the same but there's a lot of ways you can measure time uh, with the time code meter so that makes it really easy to find you know one minute in song three or two minutes and 37 seconds on song four just because of this time code um, so that's a huge thing for me uh, and then we have, of course have spect spectroscope spectrometer a bunch of cool analysis stuff one of my favorite things is the bit depth meter um, I have it floating and it's all a little goofy, but you can see this audio is 24 bit because I captured it from analog. My converters are 24 bit. You might see some little blips where I did some um, spectral edits, but more importantly, uh, a big point of confusion, you know, when I started this montage, you'll notice I, I picked the sample rate, but I didn't pick the bit depth. And that's because uh, with WaveLab, you know, we're not recording so much. So the bit depth is agnostic. You'll see that as soon as I change the, any gain or do any processing, now it's, it's 64 bit floating point processing, whether it's a simple gain change or if it's adding some EQ, you'll notice, um, I guess because it's in natural phase, it is, I'll go to zero latency. And it, you'll notice that it's remaining 24 bit until I make a an EQ change. So I like the bit depth meter a lot. It helps guide you as far as what's going on. Um, phase scope, I usually just have floating and I can call it up on a shortcut. WaveLab is highly customizable with shortcuts. Um, you can search for them and most of the functions you can add, add and I'll make your own shortcut to whatever makes sense for you, which I've done. You know, the default shortcut to insert files is shift command i i shortened it to command i because it's something i do at the start of every project i probably could just shorten it to i to be honest with you um, i did talk about reference tracks already those are so crucial I, I for me just to compare sounds and compare like i said sequenced if your client has a sequenced version you can match it up visually and odd and sonically and save a step so my whole point to all this is um, assemble once, render everything. So I've entered in the titles already, as we saw a little bit ago. The ISRC codes are in. If we had the UPC, we could enter it. It doesn't really matter so much these days. Um, so everything's there. This is the. I don't have to enter any more information. Um, everything's going to come out flush with metadata, and the DDP is going to have CD text, and it's all going to be accurate. I don't have to do it for every format. You know, I send out a lot of formats a lot of times with projects and 
part of the reason I use WaveLab is I don't have to manually enter any more data. The data entry is done. I'm just checking out my list. Um, one thing I'm going to be showing coming up here then is sample rate conversion. I'm working at 96K. A lot of mastering studios and engineers tend to work at higher sample rates. Even if stuff comes in at lower sample rates, there's a theory and argument behind um, working at a high, higher sample rate. You know, 192 is probably overkill. 96K, I think, is a great place to work, so that's what I do. Um, but I also, of course, need to deliver files at 44.1K sample rate for a lot of things, so um, there's a few ways to do it. One thing I... Um, there's a few ways to do it. And one thing I want to show quickly too that I didn't have my list is the meta normalizer. Um, if you're going to start projects, you know, if, um, this project, these files are fairly um, well balanced because I used some, did some analog work. But the meta normalizer, let's say I was got these files to master. They're a little hot, but you get the idea. Um, you can use the meta normalizer to set all the songs to the same loudness and then and there's a few ways to measure it i'll show you where it is it's in the process tab there's a few ways to measure you could do the integrated loudness i think integrated loudness is a terrible way to normalize songs from to start mastering because if you have a dynamic song it's going to be it's not going to sound correct i like to normalize songs to the um, top of loudness range, which is similar to maximum short-term loudness. Um, I see the question about vinyl. Yeah, after I do some rendering, I'll show you how I render vinyl sides, which is very cool because you can render a wave of each side and then produce a PDF file that matches that, which is really important for sides B and higher. Um, but back to the meta normalizer, this is something I do for every project before I start, um, just to get all the songs on the same page. Um, so that's kind of cool feature. You can, of course, adjust it. I like that you can adjust the clip gain before or after the clip effects. And this is all non-destructive, very clean gain. You know, if I, if I decide that um, it didn't do it to my liking when I listen by ear, I can, you know, turn it down a little more. And it's all just real time live. It's not producing new files, taking up space, uh, degrading the sound, things like that. So... I also see the question about the studio tour. Um, my studio is non-existent right now because I had to put in a new floor. But once I get it back up and running, um, it will. Maybe it's time for a new video. Um, anyway, um, I want to get to rendering, so I want to undo some of this normalization stuff. But just wanted to point that out. Very, very cool feature. Um, let's hide the bit depth meter. So. There's a number of ways to do rendering. I'm going to show you my preferred way in a moment. Um, I was talking about sample rate conversion. The only place the resampling exists is in the master section. You can see that because I have the master section floating and hidden, I don't use the master section for anything whatsoever other than um, hosting um, Playback processing. I'm not again. I'm not in my main studio, but I might have the Clarity M plugin here if it's a normal day. Playback processing are very cool plugin slots because they're a good place to put metering plugins that you don't want to be in the rendering path. Especially a good place to put plugins like uh, SonarWorks or room correction or headphone correction software that you want to hear but you never want to risk the, them being in the rendering path when you render your master files. You don't have to remember to bypass it. And it also doesn't influence the metering um, if you have a plugin inserted in playback processing. Um, so the, only, the playback processing is the only section I use in the master section, but there is a resampler. If you turn it on, you can choose the, a new sample rate, but then you gotta also probably insert a true peak limiter and dithering. And again, all this stuff in the master section, you have to manually load and save with the montage. For me, it's too much to remember to do. It's too big of a risk that something could go wrong. So I just avoid it all, and I do all my stuff in the montage, which leads to my next topic, which is um, external sample rate conversion. Some people, um, WaveLab actually has very good sample rate conversion now. It uses SOX um, algorithm. Sounds very good. In years past, it didn't sound so great when it had the crystal resampler. 
some mastering engineers, I would say a lot of mastering engineers have their own preferred sample rate conversion, whether it's Weiss Sericon or Isotope RX. Both are known to sound very good. Rate brain. I like to, I'm just old school. I'm in the habit of converting the sample rate externally and then verifying it in, back in WaveLab. So I'm just going to show you my rendering practice. And sorry it took so long to get to this point for those that wanted a quick explanation, but trying to go um, as quick as I can here through this stuff. But um, as you can see, we've got everything assembled. So when I have everything sounding good, oh, and the other reason I don't like to use the resampler in the master section is to get 96K files and 44.1 and sometimes 48, you have to render all your plugins each time um, at that desired sample rate. And that just takes a long time, especially if you have a slower computer and a lot of plugins and you're at a high sample rate, that can take a little while. So I prefer to just render all the plugins one time at the highest sample rate that I'm working at, which for me is 96. Um, so I'm going to render one long file at 96K here. The whole album is one file. And it's going to go very quickly because I have no plugins running. But the way I like to do it is create a folder called 96K Renders within the project. And I'll give this file a name that makes sense to me. I like to do this. And it's going to be version 1. So this is going to go very fast. So I want to make sure I'm prepared for it. If I had plugins going, it would take a little while to crunch all the numbers. But for the sake of this video, we'll go quick. But the whole point here is to lock in all the plugin processing, uh, all the markers, all the data entry I've done. Lock all that in, as, and it's going to create a new montage. And uh, render presets are another huge part of WaveLab for me. Because there's a lot of rendering options, and the render presets um, let you store all those. And it, it helps you not make mistakes, and it helps you get repeatable results. Um, within the rendering presets is naming scheme. So I have all these things you'll see me use at, at some point. The other thing I really like about WaveLab is I haven't even created... Well, maybe I did create this folder, but... Um, in the future, I'm going to be rendering to folders that don't exist yet. You can enter anything in this path, and if the folder doesn't exist, it creates it for you. I find this really fast when I'm trying to work quickly to just create the folder name here, and then it renders. I, it's really slow when I use other programs when you have to create the folder within their little menu thing and or in the Mac Finder, and then it's just a big slowdown. So the the rendering is a, another huge reason why I use WaveLab is because of the the uh, edit, editable rendering field and all this stuff. So render presets, a huge thing. So I'm going to use initial montage render. Again, it went very fast because I had no plugins, and it's going to look the same because there's no plugins. But you get the idea. Let's say that I had this dialed in um, master, and it's huge and loud and everything. Um, the other part of the render presets is the options. And I told it to copy markers, and I told it to create a new audio montage from the results. And I also had it bypass the master section. Even though I have nothing inserted there, for good measure, I like to bypass the master section, because just to, just to be safe. So it's created a new montage. I have a Stream Deck command that does this for me, but I'll um, what I like to do, again, is copy this name, and then save as and paste it. I just undo the underscore, because now... This montage has the effects baked in, and I change it to 2496. The reason I change it to 2496 is because I'm going to insert a dither plug in here in the montage output. That way, everything is getting dithered. Um, WaveLab has some good plugins. It has Master Rig um, down here. It has Linear Dither, Lin Dither. Just not quite in the habit of using them yet because I'm set in my ways. But WaveLab does come with a good dither. Um, a good dithering plugin. I like to actually use a different plugin called Good Dither, just because it's again, it's just so pr preset and muscle memory. I just have a hard time changing if something works. Uh, but now we have the whole montage um, with all the plugins baked in. Um, so that if I were doing any plugin work, it would 
this would all be reflected. And the other part of the other reason why I do that is for um, when songs crossfade or overlap. In fact, let me let me do that even a little more aggressive, and let me put in a I'll put in a plugin to just this is just obviously garbage setting, but it'll give us an illusion of it being louder and different. You'll get the idea. So it's going to override that. So um, part of the reason why I also render it as one file first is that if you try to render track by track with all the plugin processing, like all the clip effects, if you try to render track by track right now, you're probably going to end up with a glitch or a discrepancy or a hiccup at that transition point. I think regardless of what program you're using, it's good to, if you have overlapping audio, it's good to lock in all the processing in one pass first. And then, um, and then render track by track when there's no big effects going. Um, because now when I render um, a wave file of each song here, it's going to be perfectly gapless. There won't be a little tick or pop or anything because the only processing it has to do is dithering. And, but again, if you have, if you have, if you're at a high sample rate and you got big EQs and limiters and you try to go track by track, when you put these back together, there's going to be a glitch or a pop or something. So I like to just bake everything in. Even when um, there's no overlapping audio, it's still my preferred method just to get everything locked in. Now I can render 24 bit waves at 96K very easily. And this is kind of what I was talking about with. Um, rendering. I can copy the name of the file. To me, that's a good naming scheme. Add 2496 wave to the folder. And again, this folder doesn't exist yet, but when I hit render, it's going to exist. And put the files in there. And uh, I like to use the, this preset I've made up called 24-bit wave. And let's see what happens when I hit go. We'll check out this file. This folder is filling up with the rendered files. And you can see song one, the file name is safe. It's in part of what it's doing here with this preset, the 24 wave, it's adding a numeric prefix. You know, I never want the 01 or the 02 to be part of the song name or marker name or any of that, but I do want it to be part of the file name. So the naming scheme is huge and you can customize it for whatever you want. As you can see for vinyl, I have one coming up for side A, B, C, D all that stuff, but it just filled up this folder. And as you can see, the files have, um, are flush with metadata. And you can see um, the song title has the accented A in metadata, because that's that's valid. But um, I wouldn't suggest putting that in a file name. Again, it's kind of an innocent one, but once you start putting special characters in file names, somewhere down the line, a system is gonna have a problem with that. It could be the digital distributor, it could be, I know I've mentioned this before, but I learned the hard way that you can't, on Mac, you can end a file name with a question mark. Sometimes songs end in a question mark if it's a song title. You know, who do you love? Question mark. Um, when Windows users unzip that, it can discard that file because Windows doesn't like question marks. So my whole point is keep the file name safe and simple, but the metadata, you can put special characters uh, all you want. So these files are flush with metadata. And again, I only had to enter that one time and it's very quick and easy to copy and paste. I know people have asked if you can use a spreadsheet. I think the batch processor lets you inject metadata using a, a spreadsheet or something. I find it very fast to just copy and paste um, the titles in rather than messing with the spreadsheet and all that good stuff. So we're at 96K. That's great for that. But some clients that use CD Baby still need 16-bit 44.1 master files, which I deliver. You know, we may need to make a DDP. We may want to make MP3s. Um, WaveLab has a batch processor. Now, I'm not going to batch process these 24-bit 96K waves because they've already been dithered to 24-bit when, if you check the rendered file I made, the raw file is floating point still. We want to keep it floating point as long as possible. So I'm not gonna just 
batch process these 24 bit 96 K waves and call it a day. Cause to me, that's, that's kind of cheating and, um, being lazy. Um, wave lab has a batch processor that I could use to do it the lazy way or the correct way. Um, which in my opinion is to resample this whole wave of the whole album. And this is true for singles or EPs or whatever. Um, I'll, basically, I want to convert this floating point 96k wave down to 44.1. I'll I'll show you how to use it with a totally external app, just for those that want to use something else, because we all have our preferences, whether it's Sericon or RX. So f for me, it's not a big deal to be using a separate app because the batch processor of WaveLab already looks like a separate app, anyways. So I mean, it's not a big deal. It's not there's no, for me. There's no stress to jump out of there and do that. Cause if, again, if you open the batch processor, well, to me, that looks like a totally foreign environment anyway. So for me, I don't see the difference. You know, this, this actually looks more confusing to me cause there's so many options. If you want to watch the batch processor video, you can watch it. To me, there's too much going on. I'm just like to keep it quick and simple with that. So the really cool thing with WaveLab, this used to be painstaking years ago. Um, there's custom montage duplicate. Um, again, I have a Stream Deck thing to do it very quickly. I'll, I'll do it. What it does is it grabs the name of the montage. And sorry about these windows being in a weird spot right away. Um, not supposed to be like that. It's going to grab the name of the montage and then ask me, where is the new file? So it's going to create a new montage um, using a new file. And part of the reason why they're in, and this is just my thing that I made up. You can obviously work however you want. I have separate folders for the renders because I want the files to have the same name. Because WaveLab is going to look for a file with the same name that exists. And you can't have two files with the same name in the same folder. You can kind of trick it with um, adding things and telling WaveLab what you added. But I like to just keep the same file name so I don't have to play with this menu but basically i'm gonna hit okay and now i have an exact duplicate of my montage but as you can tell from the lower right corner we're at 44.1 all the markers um, came over with the correct names all the cd text is there the codes are there again this is all really quick to do when i'm when i'm not explaining it and i'm trying to go fast but i have an exact duplicate of my montage and i just have to press um grab the name and, and save it. And I change this to 2444 because we're at 441 and there's a 24 bit dither inserted running live. Um, and this is part of why I'm glad I made it louder. This is part of why I can't just convert the 24 bit 96 K waves and call it good. Cause let's analyze this file. It may or may not have peaks that go over zero now because of the sample rate conversion, nothing to do with wave lab or RX. It's just the nature of, converting audio the peak levels change slightly and as you can see the left channel i mean this is extremely minor but there's cases where it can be um more of an issue or not um you know um, the peak level is slightly over zero because of the sample rate conversion and i can decide if that's a problem or not um if i do decide that it's a problem i have a little preset here i, I like the Tokyo Don, um, and I only use the true peak portion of it. Everything else is hidden and shut off because, and you can listen to the delta of what it's grabbing. It's not going to grab much, but somewhere in there, there's a peak, uh, and we can decide to, to use this or not. But my whole point is I like to inspect the processing. You know, if I was actually mastering this, I'd be listening for plug-in glitches. I'd be listening for to make sure I'm still happy without sounds. I'd be listening to make sure this transition is still good. Um, I'm checking everything when I when we get as we make versions, you know. So for for me to just convert the 24-bit 96k waves down to 44.1, you know, you're dithering twice then, or you're truncating. It's a mess because again, if you just check this raw audio, it's still floating point. It's never it's never been reduced to 24 or 16-bit. Um, and now, once I decide I'm happy with it, all I have to do is, um, again, this folder isn't created until I hit go, but now I'm filling up a folder of 
24 bit 44 one waves in case those are needed um, to get 16 bit waves i just do another save as and change the dither to 16. i can be rendering 16 bit waves in a matter of seconds just by changing the folder name mp3s i can even add the artwork um, you can add the artwork to wave files the problem is most consumer media players don't read it so um, i tend to not add it to waves because most the time it won't be displayed and there can be times when artwork or even some metadata in wave files can cause a problem but for mp3s i always add it so now i'm filling up a folder of mp3s as you can see the metadata is all there and I, again i only had to enter the metadata once and uh that's a big part of why i like wave lab and then if we need to make a ddp it's as simple as uh again you don't have to mess you don't have to wrestle those windows every time that's just my different size screen make a ddp just call up the ddp window edit the folder name and now it's um creating the DDP folder and Steinberg makes a free DDP player, which I don't have installed because I tend to use this other one, but we can check the DDP and you can see that now that it's rendered, I can load it up and I can scope out the names and everything looks correct. Cause I only entered it once that way. Everything's cohesive in terms of your names and your song spacing and your sounds. So, um, you know, some people want to be able to do this all with one button. I argue that that's a bad idea because you want to be quality controlling some of these steps, you know, as they happen, decide if you want to address the true peaks that changed or not and address what type of dithering you're doing for 16 bit and 24 and stuff like that. So, if, you know, to do it all with one button, I feel like you're throwing a lot of options out the window or overlooking. Um, so then let's usually after the project is approved, so basically I have all these formats now that most of these I make after the project is approved. I don't make them all at one at the beginning, but um, I just want to show how easy it was to get multiple formats just by entering the data one time and assembling it one time. Let's say the project is approved and the client needs a vinyl master now that it's approved. Um, what I do is I revisit the, the, uh, initial montage I made that has all my plugin work, um, you know, the limiting that's running live. And I just do a little save as and call it vinyl master version one. Um, cause I'm going to make some changes for vinyl, usually removing the limiting. Um, usually not too much more than that, to be honest with you. Uh, I try to make sure my, what I do works for all formats, but most cutting engineers like to work from a non-limited source. Maybe we'll do a little DSing. You know, there's there's a whole that could be a whole nother topic. But my the cool thing that WaveLab WaveLab provides is a way to make vinyl masters um, that cutting engineers actually enjoy receiving. Um, and again. Nine ninety nine percent of projects, the client is going to want the same song order and the same song spacing on their vinyl as they did the approved digital version. So, this is why trying to do your mastering in two you know two different programs really leaves a lot of potential for errors to to sneak into the process. So, the only thing we have to worry about with vinyl is where where side A and B split. Now, this isn't a great example because it's a little lot little lopsided, but we'll say we'll do three songs per side. Um, for vinyl, it's a little ironic, but you use the CD tab. Um, and in the CD tab, we have groups. And you can use CD track groups for whatever you want to use them for. I, I use them to create vinyl and cassette sides. So I say, you know, the first three songs are side A, second three songs are side B. The nice thing is, is if you hover your mouse over that, it tells you how long it is. Now, again, this is a little, this is kind of a, just a simulation, but there's a lot of cases where clients want to know, you know, how long is side A and B and is, are we too long or do we need to remove a couple songs or shorten some songs? So it's cool that if you just hover the mouse, you can see how long it is. Now, this is obviously, this is obviously way short enough for a 12 inch vinyl because it's just a simulation. But the point here is that once you've done everything you need to do for the vinyl, you know, the Sonics, little extra, 
sibilance control, um, things like that. Um, you can render, again, there's no right way. I would say nine out of 10 cutting engineers want to get a single file for each side of the record. Occasionally I have to remake a vinyl master. That's one, every song is its own file. And then we just have to hope that they don't screw that up by adding more space between them. But by default, I deliver vinyl masters as one file per side. And to do that, I have a render preset. I'll show you what the preset's doing, but vinyl side A is going to render the source is going to be CD track group A. It's going to be a 24-bit wave. The other, yeah, the other thing I do with vinyl is, unlike the digital mastering, um, I'm going to have a 24 bit dither as the very last thing in my processing chain. Cause we're going straight to the files um, that they're going to cut from. We're not, the files I make are not going to get processed anymore by me. They, they may be by the cutting engineer, but so we're going to have a 24 bit dither and we're going to be rendering 24 bit files, but the, the preset um, does those things. And this may or may not be already in your name populated field, but for me it is because I just worked on it. Sometimes it's an older project and you have to add it again. But again, I'm going to make a folder called Vinyl, and I just really love that you can edit the folder name right here, and as soon as I hit Render, it's going to create that. So um, Vinyl version 1, because we got lucky and the client approved it on the first try, which is always nice. So I'm going to render track group A, which is side A. And the nice thing is that, you know, this right here that I've highlighted, that's kind of my general naming scheme for the record for the project. I try to have a naming scheme for the record because then all your folders look, they make sense. You know, when if I zip these up and send it to the client, everything kind of looks cohesive and it's easy to look at for me. Um, this The vinyl is going to be really no different. Um, the the file name is just going to be that for the cutting engineer to look at. And then the naming scheme adds the side A. You could always add the side A manually, but I like to just automate as much things as I can. So all I have to do for side B is check select the side B naming scheme. And it went so fast that it I have to go back to it. Select the side B naming scheme. Everything is the same, except now it's going to render track group B, and it's going to add side B to the file name. And you'll notice with, with my vinyl rendering settings, I like to have it open the resulting file so I can, of course, check it right away and make sure everything is good because you don't want to send bad files to the cutting engineer. Never a good thing. And then the other piece to this puzzle is good documentation. Now, I've actually seen some pretty high-level vinyl masters come in for quality when I have to check things for record labels and whatnot. And there's some pretty poor files being sent out for documentation because the cutting engineer does not care that the first song of side B starts at 7 minutes and 30 seconds of anything. That For them, this is zero. side B is zero again. So we're going to make a PDF for each side. And again, sorry, these keep opening up in the wrong spot. Usually everything opens up in the center. Um, we're going to make a PDF for each vinyl side, and I like to just tell it where to go. I'm going to re recycle that naming scheme. And this is one area where you do have to type in side A because there's not a secondary naming scheme here, but we'll choose vinyl. So I'm going to make a PDF. And again, these presets are something you can get from the Wave Lab Help website, but I'm going to make it. I like to start there because it's, as you can see at the top, it's choosing track group A and it's going to create this PDF. The, the PDF for track group A is nothing too special because it starts at zero in the montage. So, I mean, that's not a big deal. Where it really gets nice is side B and higher, um, as you'll see when I make it here starts over at zero again and I just like to add side B and big big red text just to help help identify it you don't have to do this but the very nice thing is you know we can see that soul wave starts at 
um, four minutes and two seconds. That's what the cutting air engineer wants to know. They don't care that soul wave starts at 1132 in your montage because to them that means nothing. They're working from this file that starts at zero again. So it's really important that your documentation, in my opinion, matches the file. So now we can look at the master files for vinyl. If I open it up, um, this is how I, another way I double check is the program duration is seven minutes and 29 seconds, basically seven minutes and 30 seconds. And I can see in the Mac finder that the file is 729. And then for this one, again, it was not a good example for vinyl, but 1050. So I know my files are matching the PDF. And then of course they have a little list of where each song starts. Um, the files also have markers embedded. Not every audio, we, we don't know what the cutting engineer is going to use, but if they were using WaveLab or something that can read markers, they're also going to get the embedded marker in their file, which is just a nice bonus. But if they're just using some, if the if their program doesn't display markers embedded in files, that's what the PDF is for, is to say, you know, song two of side B starts at four minutes and two seconds. And you might think that's obvious, but for cutting engineers that listen to music all day, it's not always obvious if it's a new song or if it's just a bridge or part B of a song. So they need to know this stuff. So I think it's great that WaveLab can produce a PDF for each side. Um, and each side starts at zero because that's really speaking the cutting engineer's language instead of, like I said, I've seen PDFs that just have the CD time and that's useless for side B and higher. So um, the same is true for cassettes. Um, I did a whole video on mastering for vinyl and cassette you can watch, but I have render presets. The big difference there is I make the cassette master from a 44.1 montage because the main place in the U.S. that makes cassettes requires the audio to be 16-bit 44.1, even though it doesn't shouldn't have to be. They just have such an old system that if you send them anything higher, they're going to convert it. So I'd rather do that conversion here. So, But a, same concept, just using CD track groups. Um, um, for rendering cassette sides. Um, I think I just showed all the rendering features. Um, a lot of it's baked into my presets here. I mean, I have presets for MP3s. Um, I'll, t I'll try to touch on single songs before I end this up because the singles I do a little differently. Um, in fact, let's see if this opens or if it was on an external drive. Um, singles are different because I, with albums, I'll do the instrumentals in a save as version of the montage with singles. I'll often do it all in one montage. As you can see here, we have the main version and we have the, uh, instrumental and in this version, you can, it, um, in this single, you can see that instead of using clip effects, I've used track effects. That's because I want, um, the same processing applied to the main version and instrumental, and I don't want to have to like remember to copy the clip effects from the main over to the instrumental. And then if I update the main at the last second, then I have to recopy it. So I rely on track effects for doing singles when they're lined up back to back. Um, and I'm separating it so you can see lined up back to back. And of course I still have the montage output, which is like the final limiter stuff, but you can see some chop marks. Um, Wave lab does let you, edit song, like I can send this little section over to Isotope RX or Spectre Layers uh, or the external editor of, or the, the built-in editor of WaveLab. And I don't do that so much for albums because then, again, you have to copy the clip effects. You can split songs up, you know, if you wanted just the intro to have a certain effects chain compared to the rest of the song, you can do that. But once you start splitting up the song into little spots for fixing mouse clicks and pops, it gets to be not so easy to manage all the clip effects. So I avoid doing that for albums and I do all that spectral editing um, before it gets into WaveLab. Um, so, but I just want to show you like a single song layout and that way um, I can render it and deliver it all at one time. Because for singles, it's usually a little easier. Albums, I deliver the instrumentals after the album's approved because it's a, there's no point in rendering the instrumentals of the album until they approve the album because it's a lot, usually a lot of songs. Um, 
audio configuration. I, I believe I did a whole video on this, but you know, you can just set your ins and outs and you can save them as presets for playback. You know, when I'm in my normal studio, I have a monitor controller. So my reference tracks go to a different input on my monitor controller compared to the main output. Um, you can, um, I'll wrap it up by talking about going analog. Um, WaveLab does have the external effects plugin, which I don't use, but some people like to use it so you can send audio to and from your analog chain. The reason I don't like to use it is because then you still have to render it. So, you know, so um, I don't really understand the, the theory of using external effects plugin to go in and out of analog gear. Because again, you have to render it somewhere and then you have to bring it back in. You know, I I would, even though I have a quiet noise floor in my analog chain, you know, I would still want to be trimming the heads and tails and stuff. So what I do is I use a reference track. When I'm going to use analog gear, I'll use a reference track. And I'll have the unmastered versions. We don't need that. I'll have, the, I'll have the unmastered versions on a reference track. And I can even, like I said, use that meta normalizer to very quickly get them all on the same page so they're hitting my analog chain in a certain way. Um, I even have a preset that normally is a good starting point to hit, hit the analog chain. You know, basically I'm sending all the audio out to my analog chain from this reference track and then recording back in. I'm I'm more of a fan of recording back into a new track, and I, again, I'm not at my normal setup, so we can't really show you. But basically, you know, you could have plugins on this clip before going analog. You could then you're sending this to your um, analog chain, which can be many outputs at the same time. You know, if you have different converters that you want to choose from on your analog chain, uh, you can send it to all the converters at once and pick that on your mon on your insert switcher. And then again, record back onto a normal audio track and kind of take it from there. That's my preferred way to do it rather than the external effects chain. But I just thought I would show that it is possible. Um, and it just, it's all set up in the audio configurations, which I know for a fact I did a whole video on analog play and capture. I'll try to do an updated one. But I think I hit all my points. Um, the Stream Deck settings are available on wavelabhelp.com. Um, you do have to have the same size stream deck that I do. I found out I have the one with 15 buttons, but I don't use it for much. I could get by without it. Um, I've also been using Keyboard Maestro, which is very cool. I can do the same things because if I'm using my laptop, I, I'm not going to carry a stream deck around. So Keyboard Maestro is very cool. I've recreated all this stuff with Keyboard Maestro just as easily. Um, but... These settings are available on WaveLab Help to download, and you can put them on your Stream Deck if you have the same one. But nothing fancy. Um, what it's really good at is doubling up, doubling up shortcuts. Let's say you always do this shortcut, and then that shortcut, and maybe one other shortcut. Um, Stream Deck is great for um, stacking those, so you can press one button on the Stream Deck or Keyboard Maestro, and just do a bunch of things at once because. You know, Reaper has scripting where you can combine actions into one thing. Um, WaveLab doesn't quite have that. So if there's if there's things you always do in order, like for me, you know, copy the name of the montage and then do customize duplicate and then have it paste in the name for me. Uh, that's where the key, that's where Stream Deck comes in handy is to kind of stack shortcuts. But um, nothing you can't do with Keyboard Maestro if you don't want to buy a physical box. Keyboard Maestro is a great app. Version 11 just came out yesterday, actually, I think. I just updated. Because um, for my laptop rig, I'm not carrying the Stream Deck around, but I've recreated that with all all the F... I use all the F1 through whatever keys to kind of get work my way through projects um, without the Stream Deck. So I think that's everything on my list for today. I tried to keep it brief, but my overarching theme here is that it's just so easy to load in files and work on them and assemble the thing one time and spit out all the formats uh, with everything cohesive in terms of file naming, spacing, uh, sounds. Um, you know, I, I really just think if you're mastering on a 
fairly regular basis, WaveLab really it takes a little while to learn. It's not it's not a, something you learn overnight. I do think you need the pro version if you're doing professional work. Elements has Elements is a cool program and it's worth the price, but there are some limitations that professional users are going to find when it comes to rendering and metadata and just little things. So I do think the pro version is what you need if you're doing, you know, mastering stuff that's going to be released and uh, want to work quickly and accurately and, and do all the things. So um, if there are any follow-up questions, just head over to WaveLab help that, or sorry, head over to the WaveLab users group on Facebook and you can ask questions there um, or the WaveLab forum. Um, thanks for watching this. It looks like there are no other questions, so I'm going to wrap it up. And hopefully this helps you get a better idea of what you can do with WaveLab. And I know I went, I didn't actually show a lot of the hows, so that's what all the videos for on WaveLab help are. It's a lot more deeper dive into sp specialized topics. All right, well, have a good evening or morning or afternoon.